Good evening and welcome to the second annual uh, Angler Lecture. Tonight's lecture is the second in the series focused on entrepreneurship and business creation. The Angler Lecture series is designed to increase the exchange of ideas and perspectives between successful business leaders and students. As students of the Angler program, we are surrounded by peers and faculty who take unconventional approaches, who see opportunities rather than challenges, and who are willing to take risks and turn in innovative ideas into reality. Each one of us has a story to create. The Angler program provides professional growth experiences that require us, require us to take ownership of the writing in our own stories. In the process, we develop skills, vision, and network to attain success. We believe that a successful university experience combines both curricular and extracurricular activities. And an invaluable piece to this experience is learning from entrepreneurs who have blazed a path of success. The Angler program is committed to identifying and bringing to campus the rock stars of the agriculture and entrepreneurship um, industries to enhance the experience of all interested students. This opportunity would not be possible without the diligence and hard work of numerous stakeholders. These key players have worked to create and continually improve the environment that allows entrepreneurial students to excel. Paul Engler, founder of Cactus Feeders and the visionary who made the Engler program possible, wishes he could be here tonight. But the impact this program has made can be seen every day on this campus and in this program. The students are looking forward to the end of the semester when we will travel to Texas to see Mr. Engler and Cactus Feeders. I cannot begin to express the gratitude I have for this program and what it has done for me as I pursue my own entre entrepreneurial endeavor. On behalf of all of the students in the Engler program, thank you for the invaluable experience you are providing us. Tonight we are honored to have our first couple Engler lecturers, and that is John and Leanne Saunders, founders of Where Food Comes From Inc. And in 1995, they founded Where Food Comes From Inc. with the anticipation of the critical information and technology verification would play in, um, play in the future of agriculture and food industries. Since that time, the company has grown to become a leader in providing source and process verification to over 6,000 farms and ranches across the U.S. A one-of-a-kind brand, Where Food Comes From Inc. combines the verification and traceability of IMI with QR codes, which allows consumers to use their smartphones to scan food product labels and quickly access detailed information about where their food comes from. Prior to founding Where Food Comes From Inc., John was born and raised on a small family farm in Northwest Ohio and attended Yale University, where he is a double major in American military history and environmental sciences. While a student at Yale, John developed a strong interest in business development and entrepreneurship as he, op he worked as operations manager of two student-run businesses, which I'm sure he'll share at least one about. Um, personally, Leanne remains actively involved in her family's ranching and stalker operations and is part of the Mayfield Heritage Cattle Company in Animus, New Mexico. Leanne was an active student leader at Colorado State where she first ran into Tom, where he was instructor for her. Um, and she has worked in all areas of the supply chain and supply chain management, from ranching and production to packing and marketing. She's a highly sought after speaker and she works with a lot of really great boards and uh, does some consulting too, I believe, on that side and she works in all areas of management and verification systems. We are grateful to have the Saunders with us tonight to share their overflowing entrepreneurial spirit, unique backgrounds, and advice. Please join us in welcoming John and Leanne Saunders. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. We, um, this is the first time we've done this, a duo up here on stage together. So you guys are the guinea pigs here this evening to see how this works. You see how it works out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and to start with, you know, you talked about bringing us on as rock stars. John's always wanted really to be a rock star. <laughs> so this is a perfect that's, opportunity. That's the first introduction I've gotten that way. So it's very good. No, but seriously, we're very humbled. Um, you know, just having the chance earlier to sit at the round table and hear what, what you guys are doing as students is really inspirational for us. 
And quite honestly, you're on a path with this program at this university with, with a leader like Tom Field that brought us here today with the leadership that we had supper with this evening to really embark on a really wonderful journey. So take the opportunity to really gain everything you possibly can from this experience because it's a one-of-a-kind experience. And I was fortunate to have this type of experience, although not this well developed with Tom in, in my previous life as a student. And I'll tell you, it will, it will pr provide a platform for you for years to come. So this is a wonderful program that you have the opportunity to be with. So we thought we would do a little tag team here. We've kind of talked about it, not very much. I'm gonna start off with giving you just a brief introduction to what our company does, for those of you who don't know. And then we're gonna step back from there and say, okay, how did we get here? And we're gonna talk a little bit about each of our history and then as a company, how we came together. And then the most important thing of the night is then to give you the opportunity to ask us questions and drill us as much as possible and gain what you can from the seminar this evening. So for those of you, who, who in here knows kind of what we do on the verification front? Does anybody have a good feel? Okay, so, so not very many. So what, when we start, when John started the company, we start off primarily focusing on identification and traceability in the livestock industry and started with a focus in beef. And he can talk about the formation of that. From that, we evolved into doing what we call verification. And really a catalyst for our business was in 2003 when we had our case of BSE in the United States and immediately lost access to all of our international markets for beef around the world, which are very valuable markets. I mean, if you think about a beef animal today, about 18% of that carcass is exported around the world and parts and pieces of that carcass that we don't consume here domestically. So our international markets to the beef industry, and not just to the beef industry, to every part of what we do from a food industry and feed grains perspective, our international markets are very critical. So the way that we got back into those international markets was with a program called process verification. And that is just a standard that's built on ISO 9000 standards, similar to what you have in, for example, the automobile industry, only the meat industry is a disassembly process, right? So they had to kind of redo that standard a bit and looked at all the elements of providing quality product to a certain specification. So when we had our incidents of BSE, the only way we could get back in there was by developing a verified beef supply, and we were specifically looking at Japan and Korea in the early stages because they were most, our most valuable markets. And in order to export into those markets, cattle had to be age verified to be 20 months of age or less at the time of harvest. Now that doesn't sound too difficult, right? The challenge for those of the, you that understand the supply chain on the beef industry side is that we couldn't, we couldn't even trace back where that animal came from, much less know the birth date of that animal. So at the time of harvest, we could verify the age. So what we started doing as a company at IMI was working with the packers and processors in this country to develop programs so that they could verify age. From that, with my entrepreneurial husband, and I'll, I'll start here by saying he's the entrepreneur, I just happened to marry an entrepreneur, and we'll talk about how that works. But he is the entrepreneur, saw this opportunity, and said, okay, we need to develop a business model around this. So what was the market opportunity? Once you get the packers and processors to where they can export, they need to supply a cattle, right? Well, it was very difficult to figure out the infrastructure. So we worked with the USDA to create a program that we could put in place at an individual feedlot, at an individual stalker operation, and at an individual cow-calf operation that would allow them to meet the Japan standard, sell those cattle to anybody, wouldn't restrict their marketing opportunities and those cattle to be age verified to go to Japan. So it allowed for us to commercialize that market opportunity and then quickly grow the business. And as a result of growing our business, enable the cattle industry to quickly grow their supply so we could get back into these international markets. So that was really a catalyst from our, for our business. And we continue to focus on those areas now moving forward. So now we help about 98% of the producers in this country verify cattle for the European Union, which is to a different standard. 
We helped the USDA in the development of their Never Ever 3 standard that we then help producers meet those requirements, which is an all natural standard for <coughs> beef brands across the United States and globally. And then just have continued to look for those next opportunities for verification and certification. Uh, a year ago, we purchased 60% ownership in an organic certification company. So we are very much focused, our core business is verification and certification. And then ultimately knew that once we had enough supply, then we could create what we always wanted to do, which was the pull through with the consumer, with a consumer-based program called Where Foods Comes From. So today, and we've just launched it in the past two years, we have this seal of approval that's going on beef, pork, soon to be poultry and lamb packages in retailers and restaurants in the United States, and we're working on some retailers in Japan, where if you see the seal of approval and a QR code, you can trace it back to the stories of the family behind the food that's produced. So that's just a quick synopsis of what we do as a business, and now we'll talk about kind of how we got here. And I'll let John take it from here. Well, um I'd have to say that uh, my, uh, my story and my, my path to get here tonight and really just to be up here in front of you guys talking is, is unique to say the least. And uh, one of the, the critical things as I sit up here and especially as I listen to Leanne talk and think about what is being an entrepreneur and what, what does it mean? Well, the first thing you have to do as an entrepreneur is come up with an idea and then the second thing you have to do is find good partners. And it was pretty clear um, to me that um, this young lady that uh, also turned out to be my wife was the critical uh, catalyst for our business. And really what, what we do today has been her life's work. And uh, I think I mentioned earlier to, to some of you all that there's two really critical parts of, of being an entrepreneur and starting a business. One is you have to have a good idea, right? We all know about that. You know, there's, there's ideas that come that are good. The second and probably as critical part of it is you have to figure out how to commercialize it. And you have to be able to figure out what the revenue model is. What's going what's gonna to drive people to, to take this idea? You know, there's, there's thousands of good ideas that, that we can think of. One of which I'm sure you've all probably engaged with today that I still don't really understand the commercialization of, and that is Facebook. Facebook is a great idea. Where's Facebook going to make any money? Down the long, down, you know, in the long term, I think there's potential there, but it's critical for all of you and any, any business leader, anybody that's starting to do it, is to really say, what is this, is this idea that we've got? Now, how do we turn it into something that people are really going to be able, willing to pay for and that's going to have a return on the investment? So how did I get here? Uh, I grew up in Northwest Ohio on a very, very small farm. I could see both sides of it. Uh, crawl <laughs> from one end to the other. Um, so, so probably different from, from many of you in the way that, that you grew up. Uh, then I had the opportunity to travel to the East Coast. I, uh, I played football and uh, was, was able to play on Yale's football team. And I, I don't know if you guys heard or not, but we're, we're picked to win the national title next year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. I'm here in Nebraska. You, got, you guys are the ones that are picked to win the national title next year. So Yale is not a football powerhouse, um, and one of the things that was, that was a real beneficial part of my experience at Yale was that there was a real focus on being an entrepreneur, and there's a lot of entrepreneurs that, that go there that, that uh, I had an opportunity to engage with and to really learn um, different things that were important to me as, as I struck out after college, really having no idea quite frankly, what business I was going to get engaged in. I just knew that I wanted to start my own business and that was the path that I was going to go on. So those of you that have been on the East Coast realize that uh, it's quite a bit different out there than it is here, um, pretty much everywhere in between the coasts. And I knew after I graduated that I did not want to be there anymore. And I'd had my fill of the East Coast. So uh, loaded up, moved to Denver and that was uh, really where I stuck uh, my stakes in the ground and that was the place that I wanted to be and uh, very shortly thereafter I had the opportunity to meet Leanne and become familiar with the beef industry and that was through working uh, with, a, with a feeding operation in Guymon, Oklahoma, some of you may know him, called CRI and it was really my first opportunity to get engaged with the beef industry on a, on a bigger level 
and it only took about a couple weeks and it was very clear that there was an opportunity in the beef industry uh, to begin tracking animals from the day that they were born until the day that they end up on somebody's plate somewhere. And the information systems associated with that, necessary to provide that tracking and that, that uh, conduit of information from beginning to end, um, those of you that know the fragmentation of the beef industry, the segmentation, you know, you really don't have a lot of packers talking to feeders and feeders talking to cow-calf producers. So the whole concept was one that, that really ran up against quite a few roadblocks at the beginning. And were it not for the ability to have the experience within the industry, which, is, which again is critical as entrepreneurs, picking your partners, who's going to help me to do this? Who's going to help me grow this concept? You've got to find the most qualified people. I, I, I tell this quite a bit, I was, I was pretty successful because after only knowing Leanne for about six months, um, I convinced her to marry me. And it only took me about another six years before I convinced her to actually come and work with me. <laughs> so in theory, it was easier for me to convince her to marry me than it was for her to come and work with me, which is a good lesson because the marriage was obviously a little bit more saleable than the business was at that point. <laughs> so what did I have to do? I had to figure out how to make the business something that, that was going to be successful in her eyes and something that she could join on and be a part of. So the, uh, everything coming up till, till now, one, one other point I want to make is I'm sure you guys are sitting out there going, are these guys where food comes from? Are they IMI Global? Are they IMI? What's the name of this company? The company was founded as Integrated Management Information. That's why we called it IMI. <laughs> it's like, what does that mean? Well, then we went and tried to get a website, IMI.com, couldn't get it. Well, IMI Global was available, so that became the name. Okay, this is part of being an entrepreneur, right? You change stuff. You, gotta, you always got to try different things. So now, and this was after the business, uh, we were in business for 12 years, 13 years is when we really had the light bulb go off. And that was where food comes from. Because that was how I could explain to my father what it was that I was doing. I wasn't tracking cattle. I wasn't providing source verification. You know, all this stuff that she just went through and talked about, that's pretty tough to explain to consumers. Well, try explaining it to your dad that had just finished putting you through college at Yale that I want to go track cattle and start my own business. <laughs> And 12 years down the road, I'm able to say, Dad, what we do is we verify where food comes from. And if you see this QR code and this logo on your package of food, we can tell you where it came from. We actually know that. And the light bulb went off for him. So stamina, perseverance, sticking to it, um, understanding who your partners are, taking good care of them, um, critical part of, of, uh, of the success equation for us. Yeah, so um, it's just kind of playing off some of what he's saying here. You know, probably when you think about those critical decisions um, and those, those points in time where it, it is the most important, you, you will bump up against moments where you're going to question what you're doing as an entrepreneur. And every single entrepreneur has this happen where they start questioning, am I doing the right thing? Is this the right thing? And so what he's saying is making sure that you have the stability with your partners, whether that's a spouse, whether that's key customers, whether that's key friends that you can always go to. You need that peer group that's gonna help you get from here to here again, because you will face failure and, and I, I talked about this earlier to the group we were talking to, but I call it stay puttedness. And I know that's not a word, but I use it all the time because what he has, which is absolutely critical, I would not have gone in to a business on my own. I would still be working for a company. I would not have gone and started my own business. But because he's got the ability, greater than I, to always stay with it, regardless of how many people, including me at times in the early years, were te was telling him to do something else, that is what it takes to be a successful entrepreneur. Entrepreneur, You have to have the ability 
to believe in something so, so wholeheartedly that you want to do this, that you're going to make it happen. Now, that doesn't mean that the path that you see in the beginning is a path you end up on. It means I am going to make this happen. You may go like this, and if you talk to most successful um, business owners, they'll tell you where they end up is not where they thought they, they were going to end up. You, know? you have to be flexible, but it's all about the goal is to be a successful business owner. And he had that from day one. And so I, I knew that, and yeah, I wouldn't go work for him because you know, we, 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 I ha wanted to have my paycheck, but he had that. And so we, we stuck with it through really difficult times because he made me believe in it. And you've, there's times in a business where he does that still today. He will stand up in front of employees and you have to have the ability in that leadership position to bring everybody else along even during difficult times. So that's tough on that top leader. It is, it is a lonely spot at times and a very difficult spot. So it's critical to have that support network. So three months ago, we um, well-established business. We've been in business now for close to 18 years. And as Leanne said, our business was, was really a big catalyst for our business was the, um, the change or the, the verification associated with exporting beef to Japan. And uh, that was 2004, roughly the end of 2004, when that uh, became a regulation, a requirement for exporting beef uh, to Japan specifically. Three months ago, guess what? They changed that regulation. So we're 18 years into a business. We're up here talking in front of you all as though we're experts. And 25% of our business is in jeopardy three months ago. So what she's saying, and I think, I think I'm almost probably too stupid most of the time. I think, you know, <laughs> she calls it stay put in this. I call it insanity that it's, that's been since day one. That was, that's a part of it. And an entrepreneur is insane in some ways. Um, it never, ever, ever ends. It's a, it's a constant battle to stay on top. And I won't get on a soapbox here, but in this environment that we live in today, um, I still don't remember the day when we changed from being a small startup company into a big bad company that's being uh, targeted in many ways from health insurance, from uh, tax regulations across the country. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing battle that never ever stops. Once you're an entrepreneur, you're always an entrepreneur and you, and you really have to maintain that that vision and that uh, persistence um, throughout. And she, she, uh, she's, she gives me all the credit, but that's, that's far from the case. Anybody that, that has been involved in this industry specifically, that would be agriculture in general. Um, it's basically controlled gambling with a lot more, uh, lot more money at stake, right? Um, to, to be in this business, as I'm, I'm sure most of you are, a lot of you are, you have those same things, and she does as well. So the, the ability to stick to something, to start something, go through those times when everybody says, you know what, that's a stupid idea. That's not gonna work. Now you need to listen to it and say, maybe they're right, maybe it is kinda stupid. Do I, is there something that I need to change in this business? But the confidence in yourself to be able to make the adjustments necessary is critical. And just listening to you guys earlier, um, I'm amazed at some of your stories. I'm amazed that you guys are, there's probably everybody in this room is sub 20, right? How old are you guys? I mean, this, you, you guys should be so proud of where you're at. Um, when I went to college, I, I talked to Lucas a little bit about this. There was two big businesses uh, on campus businesses that I was involved with. Um, <coughs> one was called the, uh, cou the couch business. And I still believe it was one of the best business models ever created. And um, uh, real, real quick, what we would do is after the end of the, the school year, um, we would rent a U-Haul, uh, go around campus to all the, the graduating seniors and juniors that were moving or doing different things, and we would purchase their couches from them. Or in, in many cases, we would just, uh, they, they would throw them out on the, on the curb, so we would just pick them up, load them up, 
took them to a storage facility, and then uh, in the fall, when all the freshmen started to come back to campus, we would go out on campus, on old campus, which is where all the freshmen were, and we, I, I won't say what I said earlier, but, <laughs> but we would, uh, we, my roommate was the, was the sales uh, powerhouse behind the business. He would sell these couches at a, at a pretty significant uh, premium <laughs> to what we bought them for, to the freshmen, and more importantly, to their, to their parents that were coming in. And uh, that, that experience, I mean, it was a lot of hard work. It was hard work because we had to do it. It was self-motivating. But it taught me a lot about a lot of basic things in, in the market. And um, one of the questions that I, that I saw that was put together was, as you guys are looking out and you're saying, what kind of company do I want to work for? You know, what, what, what do you want to do? What, do I want to go start my own business? Because that's what I did. And I don't know, to be honest with you, whether that was the right decision. I don't know if I should have gone and worked for somebody else for a little while. Um, she may have a perspective on that, um, about whether that was a good idea or not. But when I look at companies today, and you guys should all, all really have a good feel for this, there's two very basic things that I think separate companies. One is companies are either selling a commodity for the best price they can, or they're selling a value-added service. And they're gonna add value to that product, okay? So if you're a Union Pacific, or you're a coal company, you know, you're based on something that's very, very defined. In my opinion, when I look at people, companies that we wanna work with, that we wanna be a part of, and if I was looking at a company, I would wanna work in the value-added market. I would want to be in a premium market because if you're commodity, all you're doing is volume and price. Now that's a very basic formula, but I think everybody can kind of think about the things out there that you look at every day that are a commodity and those that are a premium value added market. And where we want to be, and that's what we are really doing, is we want to be in that value added market around food and people that purchase food, the reason they purchase food, everybody has a different reason that they purchase food, but we wanna be that reason, that extra reason that says, you know, I wanna know something different about this food. I also wanna be in the market where the producer, the people that are producing that food, say there's something special about this food too. This isn't just me selling it to you as, as the best price that I can, but we really don't have any more information from it, it's beef, it's pork, it's soybeans. That value added market represents something that's unique and it's something that's unique for consumers. So I talked for a while, go ahead. No, no, that's good. So I think now, um, is there anything else we should touch on before we kind of open it up? I think you guys will get a lot out of just kind of asking us questions. And if you don't ask us questions, we have some kind of in our mind that we can answer as well. So questions, things you want to know that we haven't touched on or talked about. You talk a lot. As, okay. So as, as entrepreneurs, you talked a lot about the challenges and the, the difficulties and having to stay to it. But there's got to be some joy that outweighs <laughs> all of that. So what is the joy of owning your own business? That's a good one. Yeah, we talked about all that. Um, so, th so the joy for me is having something that you, that you build, that we build together as a couple, that we get to talk about. I mean, the question was earlier, do you take it home? We always take it home. <laughs> it is who we are. It's a part of who we are. Uh, do we take it home because it's negative? No, we take it home because it's our passion. So we're talking about it all the time. So the joy for me is, is being involved in something where I think we're really providing a service to an industry, to customers that really need what we do, getting to work with great people every day, providing a work environment where we can bring in really talented people and they get to help us grow the business. So the joy is contributing to something <coughs> beyond yourself and, and then you know, providing that, hopefully a legacy of that moving forward. So something bigger than just you are. Yeah, the joys are 
enormous. The, the, the ability to, to have something that we created was, was is, is hard to explain. The flexibility to make the decisions around um, our children when we decide to, to be with them, when we decide to do something like this, this is our decision. You know, we, we have a talk and we, and we get the, the opportunity to do that. So the, uh, the flexibility, the, um, the American dream, you know, being a part of it and that passion, if I, if I worked for somebody else, I don't know that I would have it every day for as long as we've had it. And uh, I, I cherish that today. I cherish the fact that um, we work together and, we, and we, we actually like each other, you know? We, we do talk when we go home. And um, she's my best friend. She's my, my partner. I, f I feel very fortunate because of that. You know, not only is she as exceptional as she is and is, has always been, um, but uh, we like each other and she's my best friend. Okay, tell us more about like your family and how you balance that with having a business oh, and like your relationship. Do you want to start? Sure. Um, the family, uh, first of all, our kids are, are very f aware of what we're doing. They're aware <laughs> that we work together. They're aware that we're entrepreneurs. Um, in fact, last week as we were talking about Japan in front of our kids, our son goes, so is the business going in the tank? <laughs> He's 12. Um, and uh, we said, no, not quite. But you know, there's some changes going on with the business, which has been ongoing. So our ability to have really unique relationships with our kids about what it is that we're doing, about the value of money, about the value of working hard. Um, on the personal side, we both uh, probably about 10 years ago, really got into uh, physical activity. So one of our biggest releases is to exercise. Um, we do different things, so the, that, that part of it um, is, is again the flexibility side, because if I want to go take a bike ride at lunch, I go take a bike ride at lunch and we talk about it and we've got the flexibility to do that. Um, and then there's, there's a lot of other personal things that, that have been going on throughout. One is she's very involved with her father's ranch and she continues to do that as much as she, as she possibly can. I like to play music, so I play guitar at different times. Um, we, we talk about our business all the time, but I think we've got a pretty healthy, uh, pretty healthy perspective on the fact that uh, it could go away tomorrow. You know, and, and we're comfortable with that. There's, there's other things that are far more important in our church and just the, uh, the relationship that we've got with our, with our family, our community there. You know, it's, uh, so, go ahead. So I, I think um, the balance is always a challenge. You know, it is always a challenge. We have three kids, 12, 10, and 8. And, you know, I, we, we, had, we were married five years before we had children. And then, so the kids have been with us from the beginning and the start of the business. And it's always a challenge. You know, I was, here's an example. So we've got things going on in the business. I got to go home, you know, last night and my son's doing a three on three charity event for our church. So he and I are spray painting t-shirts last night till like 10 o'clock, you know. And so I, I said, I'm going to go to the Engler lecture with black spray paint <laughs> all over my arms. So the, the balance is always a challenge. And you have, you know, he, he talks about going for a bike ride. That's about the extent of the free time, you know, once you, once you have a family. But I would not give it up for anything. And you can do both. Now, things will fall through the cracks. Don't kid yourself. They will fall through the cracks. And there's a lot of pressure, you know, at many different times. And you feel like, you know, I, Tom and I are talking about tonight. And then I said, hold on, I got a text because my da middle daughter's um, soccer practice got moved to another place. So I got to coordinate with a mom to go pick her up to get her there. So, you know, that is, you, you get really good at multitasking, but that's the real world. But I would not give it up for anything because, um, and it does give you perspective. And I really think, especially for the women in the audience, it, is, it, is gr it gives you great perspective as a professional to also be a mother. 
because um, I'm a type A, I mean, died in the world type A, oldest child, every perfectionist. And once you have kids, man, that, that stuff goes away because um, things are just not gonna be perfect. And they give you so much perspective on what's really important in life. So we do our best, it's a challenge, but you can make it work. Is that too long-winded? Sorry. <laughs> um, you guys talked a lot about self-motivation. How do you guys self-motivate? Like, what is your keys to keep yourself going at times, even when it seems too big for you to handle? Go ahead. Can we start? So uh, there are times when you, so I think motivation comes from within. And I think everybody in this room in this program is already internally motivated or you wouldn't be here. So I don't think you can teach motivation. I think you either have it or you don't. If you have it, then what you have to overcome are those down times when you get down. And the way that I've overcome that is by having a great partner who when I'm down, he's pumping me up and he gets me back up. And we try to provide that balance. Um, so that's, that's what I do when I'm feeling down in the dumps about something. It, uh, at the beginning it was, it was, you know, it, it was pretty set that there was a strategy that we need to um, put in place. Over time, and, I, and I, I'd, I'd be lying if I didn't say that there was, there's a definite fear of failure. And after 10 years, 15 years being engaged with something and putting that much of your life and that much of your time into it, it was like, this has got to work. You know, there, there's really no choice in this. And um, I know her father has been ranching now for 40 years, 50 years, and he's got exactly the same, you know, it's as dry as it's ever been in New Mexico. And he's really, he's really questioning right now, you know, what, did, did I pick the right spot to ranch? Did I do these, these things right? I think there's a f fear of, you know, the motivation is this, this is a life's work put so much into it, damn thing's gonna work. And then you go for a run. Then and you, you feel much run. better after you go for a run. <laughs> when time gets bad, go for a run. It'll clear your head, you feel much better. You talked about in the early years how uh, you went about uh, talking to the different packing plants and then you went to the uh, local farmers and ranchers and how'd you go about uh, building connections with uh, the local uh, farmers and ranchers to coordinate with you and with the packer to get your company more or less going? Go ahead, you start. That's a good question. I would say that, th that our most critical asset in doing that has been strategic partnerships. So we, um, many in the, in the industry look at packers and they say that they're, they're the big bad packers. We, we took a different approach. We went to them and, and really questioned them on what they were looking for from a supply and from a verification standpoint. Once we understood that and once we built a system for it, they became our promoters. They recommended that we go to their suppliers. So um, we work with Superior Video in a very similar way that we developed a relationship with them. We developed a specific program for them that met their needs and added value to their program, and they carry the torch for us. So the, as you guys know, um, we're in a very, very diverse, uh, we work with, with ranches, I think, in all states. Not, maybe not the Northeast, but all, from Florida to Washington, California, um, Pennsylvania. So w it's a very unique group of, of producers and people that we work with that our strategic alliances that we've, that we've developed have really helped us to get out and to reach those people. So, I mean, ditto, fostering those key customer relationships where they become marketers for you, extend you far beyond yourself. And, and fostering those relationships long-term are, are critical. And, and doing what, I mean, we are very, we're a service company. So we are very focused on doing whatever it takes to, to service and satisfy our customers. We go over the top on customer service. Uh, we go 
We're constantly measuring customer satisfaction because that is our key to success. If our customer, if one customer is not happy, then you know, you know the adage, they could tell 25 other customers that you don't ever hear from. So we are very focused as a business on, on customer service and that's a culture we build from within very much with all of our employees. The customer is first. We also then very much enable our employees to meet their needs when they need it. So they don't have to call me to make a decision to serve as a customer. They're gonna make that decision. And it may, it may hurt us financially on it one given decision, but it'll come back to us fourfold down the road. And that's just how we run our business. My question is if um, you could maybe explain a little more on how your company has grown and even just like the decision to move into a space or the decision to, you were talking earlier about having them move into a grassroots kind of uh, mind, uh, mindset and getting people out in the field and kind of just expanding the growth in who you employ or different departments and kind of just the overall growth of your company. Sure. Um, today we have 35 full-time employees. Um, 20 of which are involved with our company where food comes from, 15 are with, with the company that we recently acquired that's an organic verification company. Uh, we have another 20 part-time employees that we, that we employ. Our headquarters are fairly modest in Castle Rock. It's an old bank building. Um, we have five employees that are in that office. Um, we, the, the rural development program that you, you were all talking about, I was, I was sitting there thinking, our, our typical employee is in BFE, um, went to college and had some good experiences. <laughs> What's that? Now that's being taped. Oh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, are, looking for, or are looking for high skill level employment in a very difficult place to find that type of employment. So we, we have uh, employees in I think 12 states. Um, so, so very diverse, so we have to, we have to manage a lot of stuff um, with that. Our revenue is based on audits. We conduct audits. So a producer will, will um, compensate us to come out, conduct an audit to a specific standard and uh, internally we kind of call it mowing lawns that we it's a it's a fairly straightforward business we we send an individual to conduct this audit once the producer once the audit is complete the producer has a certificate they're able to send that certificate with the cattle or with the livestock along to the purchaser of their their cattle and that documentation is what is used for them in many cases on meat that's going to japan there will be our certificates on that, on that ship, on that manifest. And that goes from the beginning to the end. Um, does that kind of answer? Okay. Yeah, so, some, so to add to that, you know, one thing that I think, we're always looking for that next market opportunity to try not to get away from our core business, but to look for ways to expand within that business structure. So new verification opportunities, new certification. Someone was talking in the round table earlier about um, the, the ractopamine issues that are going on today. So, you know, this is an example. We're working with the U.S. Meat Export Federation. We're working with packers. We're working with the USDA to say, see where the Russian market and the Chinese market is going to fall out on some of these issues. And then making sure that we have programs in place that we can tap into that market potential as soon as that market hits. So we're constantly trying to keep the landscape, looking at the landscape, seeing what that next opportunity. I think if you're stale, that's when you get into trouble. So you don't ever want to get stale. You want, like he said, we're always thinking the next shoe's going to drop. So we're always nimble looking for that next opportunity. The other thing that he's done a really good job on is looking at ways to grow um, from an acquisition strategy. And that, that enables you to get expertise that's difficult, takes a long time to build internally quick enough. So if you can find a good partner on that, on that acquisition side, it enables you to grow much quicker in an area that would take you a long time to grow organically. So we do a lot of organic growth, but he's always looking for that acquisition strategy and does a very good job looking at that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. The, the, uh, I think one of, the, one of my critical things thinking when I got started was I have to build this all by myself. I have to go create this Lego house, I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to do this. The more time I've spent and more I've looked at it, 
the, the better the opportunity for growth through acquisition and through partnership. So, so your ability to uh, find others that, that are like-minded, your ability to find others that maybe have certain things that you kind of like and you want to build yourself, but it's going to take you a long time to go build yourself. It's much more efficient to have that collective intelligence that collective power that everybody coming together, you can shortcut a lot of your hardest battles as an entrepreneur by finding acquisitions, that, that's M&A activity, but to look at others that can help you get there quicker. Because immediately what you do is you bring them into your team. They're now on your team and you're working together. You're all going in the same direction. Big change from when I started. When you guys capitalized your company, talk about the, uh, not the investors so much, but the process and, <coughs> and what it was like to, to put the, the money together to launch and what that process was like and, and how you used each other's skills and, and network to, to make that happen. Sure. Go ahead. Well, we're a public company. I don't know if everybody knows that. Um, we went public way too early. Um, big lesson um, and in the process we raised three and a half million dollars that uh, that process required all of my uh, capabilities and all of her credibility um, in the industry uh, that that we raised a lot of money from not exclusively from from within the industry um, that is a very invasive process. Um, the minute that you decide to take on outside investment, it could be three million, it could be 30. Doesn't matter. When you decide to do that, there's a lot of things that you really, really need to, to think about. And um, for us, we, you know, one of the, one of the things that, one of the questions that was asked was about where, where do you run into ethical issues? I ran into an ethical issue with the gentleman that wanted to take our company public. And one of the biggest mistakes that I made um, was allowing others to create the financials associated with the money that we were raising. Meaning that somebody else said, if, you, if we do this, your business is going to grow by 20% every single year. Well, that was ridiculous. There was no way we were going to do that. That created a trap for us at the very beginning of the process where we had promised, we'd over-promised and under-delivered. That's a big one. Don't do that, especially when you're raising money. So when you raise money, when, and again, it can be very small amounts, it can be very big amounts, make sure you're doing it from people that you trust and you can work with, and that you do it in a realistic manner. You don't say that this is going to be the next Microsoft because it's not. It's not going to be the next, next Facebook. That, that doesn't happen. I thought for six years Bill Gates was going to knock on my door you know, and say, hey John, good job. I'll take it from here. <laughs> I still haven't heard from him. You guys know him. Tell him to give me a call. But, so, so you're stuck with the realities of your business. And the last thing you want to do just ask Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, that's what happened to Facebook. That's why Facebook is now where they're at, because they, they thought they, they listened to people that said, your business is worth this. I don't even think it's worth this, but he listened to people that were way too far down the path, and it creates problems. And uh, you know, that, that, I think, in general is, is critically important. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely, and, and, and you get pressure, and you'll get pressure. As soon as you take one dollar of outside money, you add a whole layer of pressure, and it happens, and you have a lot of, you have to do that to grow, and there's, there's, you, you need to do that, but just understand, that adds an entire new layer of pressure, and whether you're private, and you're doing private placements, or raise, or public, and you go public and raising public money, and you have investors, and you have to sit on the quarterly calls every quarter and have to talk about if the trend line for revenue is going down or up, it adds an entirely new layer of pressure when you take one dollar from someone else. So that's just something to keep in mind. And you have to do it in a lot of situations to grow and prosper, and it's not a bad thing, but you just have to be very realistic about what that does. 
Yeah, I, I think it's a very positive thing. I don't want to give anybody the impression that raising money is a bad thing because it's critical. You've got to do it. You know, people have big ideas. You can't, most people can't fund their own ideas. You know, so you need to have that. I also think the collective intelligence part of it, people that have money typically have money for a reason. They're smart. You know, they, they or not everybody, but you know, there, there's, there's, a, there's a value there. So having those people on your team are not necessarily bad things. Any other questions? I've got one more question, and that's, um, you know, as you evaluate opportunities, sometimes, sometimes decisions in some situations have to be made very quickly. And so you, you hear entrepreneurs talking about gut reaction versus doing the analysis, the market analysis and the other kind of analysis. I just wanted your reflection on, you know, uh, those two choices or options or way of, of uh, looking at an opportunity. Good question. Go ahead. I would say nine times out of ten, those quick decisions typically are made on, based on experience, but gut reactions. So educated, those quick decisions, educated gut reactions in most situations. If you wait too long, especially in a business like ours that's very entrepreneurial, to do the market analysis, to get back all the feedback from that, to do all the research necessary to make everybody feel comfortable, you've lost the market opportunity and someone else has already taken it. So if you're a market leader in an individual category, um, you're there because you're seeing that market opportunity first, long before the market research will catch up to it. That's my so uh, about six years after I started the business, I got this idea that I was going to start a business called Answers. And it was it spelled Answers and Z on the end. And it was computer support from A to Z. And I was like, this is great. I, I spent probably two months. Yeah, she's laughing. <laughs> I spent two months working on this business plan. Uh, had a really good logo, did all this stuff, and, and really went through and did my homework and spent the time necessary. So uh, I don't think we raised, didn't raise any money associated with it, but after about a month worth of doing this, guess what came out of the woodwork, the business that started? Geek Squad, okay? So Geek Squad immediately took all of the steam out of answers and answers became nothing more than what I talk about at things like this. It's, <laughs> it's literally a business plan that's left. So on the flip side, and I've heard everybody is familiar with Whole Foods, right? Okay, does everybody know who the CEO of Whole Foods is? It's a guy named John Mackey. John Mackey started Whole Foods in Austin in the 30, 30 years ago, 25 years ago. Whole Foods understands consumers better than anybody. They, you know, they spend time looking at this. The story about Whole Foods and John Mackey and the whole new program that they've got, which is built around animal welfare and some other issues, was the result of a shareholder meeting where a woman got up and said, Whole Foods is getting duck from a supplier that, that is inhumanely treating their ducks. And he's, he, he never heard anything like this. I didn't even know that they sell that much duck. But it was, it, it, it was, he was taken aback. And, and he said, I don't know about this, but I'm going to find out. He went out that next week went to some of their duck suppliers the following week. He made a decision. They were going to implement this whole animal welfare program within their store. So everybody believes that Whole Foods did a ton of market research to make this decision to go down this path, very similar to the one that they just went down with GMOs. Last week, they made an announcement that they're going to have only GM, GMO-free products in three years or whatever. I would be willing to bet anything that was a decision made almost at the top just by him saying, you know what, I don't want to eat GMO food anymore. It's a consumer issue. We're going to do something about it. So I agree with her that uh, you can spend a lot of time going through and, and evaluating a market and, and putting your research into it. And for reasons that you may have no idea about, you have to, uh, it just doesn't work out. So my problem is, and she'll, she'll attest that my problem is, is that I have a new idea every day. And I come in and say, hey, we've got to do this, we've got to do that. And my, my sounding board, my internal team, comes back and says, that's stupid. You know, we need to, 
we'll take this one, we're not going to take that one, and because I do, I, there's a couple new ideas every, every week at least. So, too much. We had sent you guys some, just a, some questions in advance just to stimulate your thinking. You might just take a couple of those that you thought were intriguing and, and answer those that, that you thought that maybe we haven't gotten to that you thought would be sort of some that spark good conversation between the two of you. Sure. Yeah, I think you have one question back there, too. Oh, I was just curious. Uh, um, when you started out as, as a couple with a business and were involved with it, um, at what point and, and how did you determine that it was time to expand and hire people either in management and personnel or production or inspection or whatever? What, what, did you have a business plan that said, by the time I get to a certain point, this is a goal that I have? Or, or how'd you get there? That's that a, that's a tough a one that I find all the time with, yes. with people get to a point and then all of a sudden they don't know where to go next. So how did you determine that? That is an excellent question. Um, do you want to answer? No, go ahead and I'll take it. We okay. can tag team. Well, when we, when we started our business, it was, I was a consultant. So I was, it, the only way we generated revenue was I had to go out and do programming or do some work, to do some physical work. So <coughs> the real change for me was when I got to a point in, in saying that I needed to have others or revenue models that would allow others to do that consulting in a more process-oriented way. So we could create scalability within the, within the business and have a recurring revenue model. My mindset and when, where, we where we really changed, because before that we'd had two or three, we'd had a secretary or somebody come in and help us with different things, but we really didn't start to build the model of the business. When we looked at our business and said recurring revenue, and all you entrepreneurs out there, that's a, that's a critical thing that you need to, to think about. How do I create a recurring revenue model that does not require I be there doing it? It could be others, it could be a system, it could be a process. When we made that decision, and when we really got to a point where we understood that, our, that's, that's when we took off as a business, because we could we could justify the overhead. We could justify um, duplicating the process and, and doing it in a much broader way. Before then, it was all just kind of yeah. throw it up against the wall. Throw it up, yeah. And we are very systems focused now on those decisions. So when we, now when we bring on somebody new, we have to have the revenue to justify bringing on that additional hire. And, and because of how our model works from a P&L perspective, you know, that's easy to see. You know, at this point, we need to bring on this person. And when it comes, to, and, th and that's also why we have the mix between full-time employees, um, part-time employees, and then independent contractors that we work with because of the different models, uh, systems, to make sure that you don't get out of balance. Um, the challenge is with salaried individuals in a business when your business retracts and not losing talent when you're not profitable. That's the challenge. And you know, we all face that. And that's really a tough time because you then do have to make difficult decisions in a business that are not fun decisions, but are just ones you have to make. I think um, one of the, and Tom says it's on your, your um, book list to read or whatever, but one of the, the Starbucks book Onward, I, I, it was a recent business book that I think is very fascinating, has a lot of really good lessons in it, just about how he is an entrepreneur, the ups and the downs, um, and a lot of things translate a lot across a lot of businesses in that book. So I, I found that to be very inspiring, reading through that again. Because, you know, even Starbucks, you think, oh, they've been so greatly successful. They've had some tough times, really tough times. Yeah. And, you know, got, had strategies that just did not work out. And they had to retract and lay off a bunch of people and close a bunch <coughs> of stores. And, you know, you don't hear about that very often. 
maybe in closing we can kind of wrap it up and maybe if you guys want to answer some of the questions that were in your packet if any um, that Tom had given you and just maybe any last advice before we move into the reception sure um, well the, the one there was a couple that were really geared around um, where you guys are sitting and when I look back at where I was when I was when I would have been sitting watching me what would have been the person or the talk or the conversation that would have got me first of all to listen um, you guys are all here and it's dark so that's really cool you must be getting credit for it or something huh? Um, the fact that you're here and you want to and that you really want to understand those things I, as I said, I, I really felt, um, I think one of the questions was, what, what should we do the last semester of school? What, and I think, it would, I think it would translate very well into, what would I do the last three years of school or four years of school? And what are the things that I really need to think about before I go out and decide to be an entrepreneur? Um, again, there's, there's all kinds of different give and take on everything that, that has been done. So when I graduated, the decision for me was, do I want to go earn a salary and over the next 10 or 15 years, hopefully make a salary that improves? And maybe over those 15 years, I could put away a pretty good amount of, of income you know, and be successful that way, working for somebody else. Or the decision that I made was to swing for the fence, but to strike out for about 10 years until we actually, I actually made the connection. And that trade-off is really one that each of you all need to make personally. You know, do I want to go take that risk um, for, the, for the long haul? Is money important to me? Is money important to me in the short term? Am I okay with uh, making 27, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, that's my number that I, when I was 33 I was making $27,000 which wasn't very much and uh, are you okay with doing that because that requires a certain degree of humility and uh, long-term thinking to get to the next level so everybody has to make that that decision for themselves I would say that it has been a wonderful ride for me and to go through 17 years to get to today to where we're at it's a no-brainer. I don't know if I'd do it again, but it's a no-brainer at this point. So then my answer to that would be I wouldn't change anything. I wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't change anything of what I did education-wise. You know, I, I was fortunate like you all to have a wonderful mentor like Tom Field and a couple of other mentors. And, and, and the path that you go down I would just say enjoy every minute of it because life is so short. In a blink of an eye, you're like, oh my goodness, we've been in this for you know, 18 years and we've been married for 18 years and we have a 12-year-old son. Just enjoy it, you know, whatever you decide to do because it's just over and enjoy the journey. You know? And you will fail and you'll pick yourself back up and you do it all over again, but do what you love and do what it, you enjoy. And if you have that entrepreneurial spirit, chase it, boy, with everything you got. Give it all you got because um, very few people have it, first of all. And if you've got it, chase it. Um, so that would be my response. I wouldn't change a thing. Not even all the dark moments. No way, wouldn't change it. Thank you so much and join me in thanking these guys for coming out.